Good evening. My name is Cathy Gill. Tonight, we acknowledge the First Nation people of this land. We pay our respect to elders past, present and future and acknowledge that sovereignty has never been ceded. Tonight, our First Nation speakers come from many nations across the Northern Territory. We wish to thank the First Nation speakers for giving their time to speak out about their lived experience under the intervention laws. We appreciate that it can be difficult and that it has been a long time that people have been speaking out in an effort to be heard and acknowledged. We welcome everyone who is listening online and we thank you for being here. We are recording this event and, and do hope to have it online for those not able to attend. During the event, if you wish, you may send comments via the chat line. This forum has been organised by Stop the Intervention Rollback Action Group, IRAG, based in Alice Springs, Concerned Australians, based in Melbourne, and Stop the Intervention Collective Sydney, called STIX. We thank all speakers for joining us tonight, but before handing over to Professor Larissa Berendt, who has kindly agreed to be our moderator, on behalf of us all here, I'd like to congratulate Larissa, who recently was awarded the Order of Australia. This award recognise, recognises her distinguished service to Indigenous education and research, the law and the visual and performing arts. Larissa is, sorry, Larissa is an acclaimed writer, filmmaker and broadcaster, promoting Indigenous knowledge and culture. And so now, without further ado, I'm handing over to Larissa, who will be our moderator this evening. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Kathy, for that lovely introduction. Can I begin by acknowledging um, that I'm on Gadigal land of the Eora Nation and pay my respects and my respects to um, elders past and present and to all the First Nations uh, people who are on this call. It's, it's my honour to be hosting tonight. Um, the, the intervention is um, the, the worst um, infraction of human rights we've seen in recent times in relation to Aboriginal people um, and paved the way for the continuing erosion of rights. And it's my honour to be hosting a forum uh, where some of the strongest, most continuous voices in speaking for the people who were most affected and have lived with that, um, are able to share their experiences and their wisdoms with us. So um, I'd also like to thank all of you for taking the time to listen uh, to the speakers tonight, taking time out of your evening to hear these really important voices and perspectives that we don't otherwise hear. We've got a range of um, amazing, insightful people speaking tonight. We'll have um, Arnie Pat Ansel Dodds, uh, Harry Jackamara Nelson, uh, uh, we'll have Amelia Kunath Monks, Barb Shaw, and hopefully um, Yinya Goyala, who's having a bit of was having a bit of trouble finding us, but hopefully will be here as well. Um, and in addition to that, we've also got um, Stephen Gray and Greg Marks who'll give us some insights as well. So um, really interesting speakers and a lot to get through. Um, I just wanted to uh, begin also by just reminding everyone that the intervention began in 2007. Um, it was later revealed to be pretty much a political stunt in the lead up to an election, uh, which makes the sorts of measures that were uh, made uh, from Canberra that affected the lives of people on the ground in the Northern Territory with no consultation with them, no respect for their, their wisdom and understanding about what works best, no respect for their own leadership and advocacy. So um, it was certainly um, a moment of, of great shame for Australia. Many of you might remember that in order to pass this package of legislation, um, it meant that the Racial Discrimination Act, the um, Anti-Discrimination Act in the Northern Territory and the Social Security Act had to be repealed to ensure that people grossly affected by these policies weren't able 
to, um, to complain about them. It took their voice away further and I think was a good benchmark to say how, um, to, again, against which to, to measure the reforms that were looked at um, in relation to land, housing, culture, language, education, um, and welfare reform. So um, I think it's also important to note that uh, in subsequent years, uh, particularly under Labor and under uh, Jenny Macklin, that uh, some of these reforms were doubled down on, they weren't improved, despite the growing evidence, uh, which had been predicted by uh, Aboriginal leaders across the Northern Territory. So um, I think it's important to maybe start with a bit of a snapshot about uh, where we are now 13 years on. Uh, to do that, uh, we're going to start with Dr. Stephen Gray, who's a senior lecturer at Monash University Faculty of Law and an associate to the Caston Centre for Human Rights Law. Um, he's published widely on Indigenous legal issues and stolen wages, criminal law and Indigenous art and culture, so across the areas that were affected by the intervention. And he has been um, the lead researcher in an evaluation report called the Northern Territory Intervention and Evaluation that was published uh, in February this year. So, um, Stephen, can I hand over to you to talk through some of the key findings of the report and some of your observations about where we are now 13 years after the intervention? Thank you, Larissa. And I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land where I'm speaking from, which is in Melbourne, the Wurundjeri, people um, and also pay my respects to their elders, past and present. And um, thank you very much for inviting me to speak here um, in front of all of so many eminent people and so many people who have um, fought very hard against the intervention. I actually don't want to speak for very long. Um, I really would like to hand over to or to hear from um, First Nations people this evening. But um, yes, I... Um, at the Caston Centre for Human Rights Law, um, as Larissa mentioned, it's um, part of Monash University, so we focus on human rights issues. And um, several years ago, um, well, I actually lived in Darwin myself for about 15 years, so it came from that experience, really. But um, uh, we started to look at the Northern Territory intervention. I remember when it first came into force and remember from living in Darwin how... Um, how differently um, Indigenous people were, were seen by the majority non-Indigenous population. It seemed to be almost a, a smear, um, the way that that whole thing was framed way back then. And um, I don't think it's improved fundamentally since then. So as Larissa mentioned, um, it began by repealing the Racial Discrimination Act, or at least changing, so um, <laughs> amending it so that it didn't apply. Um, to Indigenous people, which in itself is an, an insult and had dramatic effects. And the Labor government, um, when it came into to power, um, while it restored the operation of the Racial Discrimination Act on its face, it also said that um, the Northern Territory intervention is a special measure that's applicable. Um, and so the idea behind this special measure was that it's meant to be something to improve the lives, something that's that's specially designed for Indigenous people. Um, so anyway, we we produced um, that first report in 2016, and um, the Northern Territory intervention that failed on so many measures, um, things to do with employment, so many of the things that it said it was going to do, basically in terms of um, supposedly overcoming um, all the things that were meant to be wrong with the lives of Indigenous people that had failed on in areas of employment, it had failed in, in, in health and life expectancy. What we really um, focused on mainly was incarceration rates, um, it, it, that, that's uh, Aboriginal imprisonment rates, um, which as we all know, I'm sure, have, have always been a national disgrace and um, they haven't improved since the Northern Territory intervention. They haven't improved since the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody back in the early 90s. In fact, they've got a lot worse. Um, and I was very surprised that the NT intervention never, um, never even had it as a target, never, 
didn't focus upon this issue of incarceration rates, which is really crying out as a national shame. And so that's something that we tried to campaign on fairly hard. Um, we we, we um, kind of a bit of a marketing tool, I guess, but we, we scored the intervention on in, in between zero and 10 um, as a way of kind of getting the, the general media, I guess, to be interested in some of these issues. And so often they are swept under the carpet. And we thought on incarceration rates that the intervention deserved as big fat zero out of 10. And it really um, continues to be, so in the most recent version of the report, it hasn't improved on that front. Um, another, another area that we thought was very important was the income management regime, as I'm, I'm sure you would um, very well know. Um, the, the, the part of the original intervention um, strategy was to bring in that discriminatory income management regime, um, which applied across the board to so many Indigenous communities around the Territory and sequestered or took away um, a large percentage of Indigenous people, I think it was 50% of the original income management regime of, of income and forced people onto this basics car, which was a humiliating kind of a thing for people to have to do. And um, that's still in operation, or it's actually been extended in the form of a cashless welfare card now. So um, that's something that we also, th also think is important um, to fight against this idea that, that um, welfare can be extended in that way or to be given out, I suppose, um, in such a humiliating way. Um, so that, that was a couple of the issues that we, we spoke about. Another one was um, Indigenous customary law. Um, the intervention took away the ability of courts in the Northern Territory to consider Aboriginal customary law in sentencing and in bail decisions. And that's, um, again, that's an overtly, that, that's a discriminatory thing to do. Any other group of people in the, the Northern Territory or elsewhere are entitled to have their customs, their rules, their, their whatever you want to call them, um, you know, everything that's relevant to the, the person who's being sentenced or who's up in a bail decision is, is, can be taken into account by a court, as it should, whether it's a positive thing or a negative thing. And yet, when it came to Indigenous people, the people who've been in this country for way, way longer, you know, orders of magnitude longer than anywhere, anybody else, um, the colonial authorities took away the ability of the courts to consider that customary law. Um, in making bail and sentencing decisions. So again, that, that's a, a pretty outrageous thing and um, it's still essentially there. So um, we thought that was something as well that, that um, tried to draw the attention of the higher authorities to. Um, that was pretty much all I think I wanted to say for the moment. Well, that's that's great context to to go into now really talking to people who are on the ground and um, are, are living living this and can give us some insights and it's it's my great privilege now to introduce auntie pat ansel dodds um, who is a member of the arenta and amateur nations she's a renowned artist a writer a lecturer a campaigner for Aboriginal land rights and passing on local Aboriginal history and culture from her own experiences. She's also doing incredibly important work as a member of the Alice Springs Grandmothers Against Removal and remains incredibly outspoken and strong about the ongoing Northern Territory intervention and has been uh, somebody who's been for a long time calling for a treaty. Um, and uh, in very recent times with the Black Lives and First Nations Lives Matter movements, uh, Arnie Pat has begun having positive conversations with Alice Springs Police and wants to engage them with cultural awareness uh, training. So you're all on mute and you can't uh, clap her, but I think if we go like this, she can know that she's very welcome. <laughs> Arnie Pat, over to you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, I, when I look at uh, the history of, um, of Australia and our people here, it was devastating because um, when I was uh, young, my people weren't citizens of this country until 1967. And to me, that's appalling. 
and didn't get recognised until there was a freedom fight by Charlie Perkins and students from New South Wales University. And in my head, all that problem that we had back then is still here. And the way they're treating our children is terrible. I've often walked down the streets and I've told the policeman off, why are you doing that to this kid? He's not grown up, he's a kid. And those children look at me and ask me to help them. And it hasn't stopped. I've seen that kind of behaviour all my life. But now, this young man that works at the police station, he's a police officer, he wants to talk to me to try to mend a lot of issues. And I think that's fantastic. But um, we have a racist government that likes just to get funding off of us mob um, from our communities who have fought very hard through land rights. And even in town here, we fought over native title of Alice Springs and we won. And then they want to change it whenever they please. So it's still happening. And they don't have any respect. They wanted people to go to Uluru to sign a paper what they wanted. But that's not good enough. Like we got no brains. We have to move forward. Keep wanting our treaty, our rights. So governments can't keep changing policies that affect the lives of our people anymore. Mm. It's got to stop. Thank you. Ani Pat, can I just um, follow up because you're you're obviously doing a lot of work around making sure kids stay with family, and I wonder if you could share with us some of your thoughts and observations about how kids need to be taken onto country to heal um, and not in prison. Can you talk to us a bit about that work that you're doing? Yeah. Um, I, um, the grandmother's group, a lot of us from around her mom from here, we wanted our kids to, to lower the case, the age that they've been put in detentions. They lifted higher from 14, not 10. And that's important. So those kids can go back home to their country. And uh, Chris here, he's um, from his Aranta and he's got a program for some kids to go back to country and start learning their culture and country and learn how to live. And this town, no matter what we do, it's always been, oh, they're Aboriginal. They must have, must have done something wrong. And we're tired of it. But we want to move forward and start telling our kids to be proud of who they are. And don't make them in such in a place that they can't grow up and look at a future. And we've got to have a future for our kids no matter which, which nation they come from in the territory. So important. And we're looking at stuff as well in a bigger picture. Yeah. We want them to go back to country and let their old people and teach them their culture. Do that to us even today. It's so important. Yeah. Because that gives us strength of where we come from. Thank you. And, and Ani Pat, if I could just ask you one more question, because we're looking back at what, you know, 13 years on from, from the intervention, and I was wondering if you could share with us, you know, what, what the impact's been on you and what you'd like to see changed going forward. One of the big things I feel is that um, the kids... The government has to give them the funding that they were allocated to after they got uh, after they fought for their land and set up their own communities and to have like CDP programs so they can go back home, their parents. Not stay in Alice Springs, live on Senalink. 
it's so important that the kids go back home. Was there schools and stuff there as well? Because they come here, they're so mixed up in the head, the whole family, and the kids could run amok. And we have to stop it. Send them back home to their country so they can get a job. Give them funding to do that, to run their own councils and everything. And employ people on their communities like they did before when they won their land back. Not this stuff, dictate to Aboriginal people every time they want something, be racist. How can you change the racism law to get your funding of 73 communities and lock them down? That's disgusting. All right. Okay, thank you, Arnie Pat. All right, um, again, we, Arnie Pat can't hear his clap, but we can all sort of wave and thank you. <laughs> thank you for sharing that with us. Um, no worries, thank you. <laughs> it's now my, my great privilege to introduce Uncle Harry Jackamara Nelson, who's a Walpuri elder from Yundamu. He's so much more than that, but in true sense of mm -hmm. our elders, very modest about that. And, and Uncle Harry's going to share with us how the intervention um, affected Yundamu. Uncle Harry? Thank you, um, Larissa. Hello, everybody. I am more than privileged to be here tonight talking to my sisters and brothers. within Australia, our country. Instead of, um, I'd like to, to, the, to the guests in the audience, read some of the things I've written down, we've taken note, uh, the result of the intervention that would affected my people at the end of the world. The intervention was sprung on us without warning, with no consultation, a lot of lies were told about our communities. Pedophile rings, violence, rivers of grog and dysfunctions. Five prime ministers later, they never took the lies back. Little Bit of self-determination we had, they took from us. We no longer have a social council, local council, I beg your pardon. The council is run from Alice Springs. A big mob of white fellas came and they run everything for us. These Outsiders don't talk Walbury and don't understand or respect our culture. It isn't easy for locals to get a job. Most repairs and building is done by outside contractors. Lots of new rules. Biggest lot of money ever spent on Yundamu was more than $7 million to build a new police station. We've got more police than ever and more people in jail than ever. The welfare mob keep taking children away. Don't respect our extended families. White bosses don't respect our elders. Our children see this and also lose respect in us. Everything is done in English. We have no say in running our own lives on our own land. It is like we are under occupation by a foreign power. Uncle Harry, I wonder Just if- Hang on, I haven't finished yet. Sorry, Lois. <laughs> I said that we had another question. I'm so sorry. Yeah. 
if they were going to finish this last bit off. Uh, what is the situation like in Yundamu today? Nothing much has changed. They keep tightening the screws. They're trying to turn us into white fellows. <laughs> we are proud Warri people and <coughs> they have no right to control us like they do. We want our local council back. We want our houses back. We want police to respect us and stop wearing guns. We want self-determination and respect. We want to run our own lives again, our way. We want the government and the media to stop lying about us, lying to us. We want them to listen to us. Only then will we listen to them. Thank you. Thank you, Uncle Harry. Um, so can we um, show some appreciation for Uncle Harry for his wisdom? Um, Uncle Harry, I wonder also if I could just ask you if, if, um, if the Prime Minister came to visit you, um, what would you like him, what would you show him and like him to know about the changes that you want today? That's a bit of a hard question there. You know, we all know what we think about these bosses, how they've been treating us and uh, uh, our attitude towards uh, these gabbas or white fellas or whatever you like to call them. Uh, well, it's the same. The feeling right throughout the uh, our nation of Aboriginal people throughout mm -hmm. Australia is the same. Our attitude towards them is not 100% sure. We're not quite sure with our white people that we work with. Some we do, with some we do. All right. Thank you, Uncle Harry. Can we all give Uncle Harry a clap? Thank you. Thank you so much for taking some time with us. Um, I'm going to now um, ask Greg Marks to speak to us. Hi, Greg. Good um, uh, Greg is an international human rights law expert specialising in Indigenous rights, and he's lived and worked in the Northern Territory and has retained a very close interest in those issues. He's also a centre associate of the Indigenous Law Centre at the University of New South Wales. And... Uh, formerly the convener of the Indigenous Rights Committee of the International Law Association. Um, he has a, done a, a lot of hard yards in the area of um, Indigenous rights, particularly from an international perspective, and he's going to share some insights with us now. Thanks, Greg. Oh, thanks, oh, Rita. Welcome, Greg. Thank you. And uh, good evening, everybody who's on this forum. Um, what I... Uh, I'll be looking away from the camera a bit to look at my notes, so I apologise for that. Um, what I want to do is just to try and provide, from uh, how I understand it, an overview of the changes in government policy impacting on Aboriginal communities in the Territory over the past 15 years. So I'm taking the perspective a little bit wider than 13 back to the, to the intervention, because I think some of these things started a couple of years before the intervention, uh, and they all sort of work together. So I, mean, I think there's been a, like a tsunami of change coming from a few different directions at the Northern Territory and causing a lot of damage to the lives of Aboriginal people. And so I thought I'd just try and take some of the different strands out and then sort of put them back together again because I think it's a little bit hard to track all these different elements of this stuff, which is partly the way that governments get away with these things. Um, so I'll just start... Uh, I'll put out one critical date for, this, for a start, 2004, because 2004 was the abolition of ATSIC. And once, once ATSIC was out of the way, the government had a clear run because there's no large, resourced, independent body to call them out. So it loaded the dice uh, in the favour of government. Um, now, the main strands of this tsunami, as I see it, three, I see three. The first one is so-called land tenure reform. Uh, that's where Aboriginal townships are leased back to the government for 99, 40 years. So that started in 2006, just before the intervention actually started. That reform 
and I think this picks up what Harry was saying, that reform is all about, I said, it's all about control. Um, it's the Commonwealth Government taking back control of major Aboriginal communities across the Territory. The government needed an excuse, and the excuse is the security of assets. They say they will not fund houses, schools, infrastructure without a lease. I mean, they did so for 30 years before that, but suddenly found that it was impossible without a lease. Um, so what's, what is the motive behind this land tenure reform, they call it? And the motive, I'm quite sure, is to get traditional owners out of the decision-making process. Um, that's the main objective. Uh, so no matter what level of consultation might go on after a 99-year lease is signed, um, really, uh, it's the government that makes the decisions for the next 99 years. So that's, that's three or four generations. Um, so the control of the land for the community to sign up, as I said, is effectively alienated. Uh, it's lost to Aboriginal people. And these communities are where the majority of Aboriginal people outside the regional towns live. So it's a major target, really. Um, so another object of this uh, tenure reform was to break up communal ownership. Right? So the, the argument was that residents would be able to own their homes by subleases. Now the government was just hooked on individuals owning homes uh, because that's what white people do, basically. That's one strand I see, and it's not quite the intervention, but it's also part of the intervention. The second strand, um, and the most dramatic, of course, is the intervention itself. Uh, but it's, it's changes to a whole lot of stuff. We know uh, social security, compulsory leases, police stations, customary law, uh, all those things are talked about. Um, and for that, as we know, uh, any excuse would do for public consumption and the little children uh, sacred report provided perfect cover for the intervention. So here we had the army, government business managers. So it was, it was a massive rollback of the right to self-determination. It imposed discriminatory measures, got rid of the protections of the Racial Discrimination Act, used the bogus excuse of special measures, which with special measures, what they basically said was that we're going to take away your rights so we can give you rights. So it's not, uh, it doesn't really add up, of course. But I don't need to go on with that because everybody knows about the intervention. Aboriginal people have lived the thing uh, and, and are talking about it tonight. Aboriginal people have been to the UN about it. The UN Special Rapporteurs have been to Australia and criticised it. And then, of course, you've got Stronger Futures, which is Mark II of the intervention. So that's the second strand. That's the one we're celebrating, if that's the right word, tonight, the 20th anniversary. The third strand of this tsunami is the one that I want to really emphasise tonight, because it's, at least to the wider public, it's the one least known. Um, it's the attempted slow death of the outstations movement. So this time, the excuse was that outstations and homeland communities were not viable, and that was the excuse. So the government from about 2005 uh, on wanted to get rid of outstations and homelands. There's absolutely no doubt about that. I've sat across the board from the architects of these policies, and that's what it's all about, getting rid of outstations and homelands. But they were too smart to just try and close them all down, close them all down at once. For one thing, there were too many people living on outstations. So to close them down straight away, it would have been too difficult. So what they went for instead was what I'm calling the slow strangulation approach, the starving of funds and services approach. So they, they, this is, sounds pretty cynical, but they were prepared for older Aboriginal people to live out their lives in homelands communities. What they were after was the younger generations to get them into larger communities or towns to break their connection, their attachment to their traditional country. So the approach was to give the Arstatians no real future, to stop them growing, to make daily life a struggle, uh, a battle just to keep things going. And this is where the defunding of outstation housing came in. That's the critical element. Other things too, but that's the critical element. And the key to that was a memorandum of understanding, an agreement between the Commonwealth Government and the NT Government about accommodation and infrastructure uh, on, out, on Aboriginal communities. And that agreement was signed in September 2007. So that comes just you know, uh, two or three months after 
the intervention. Um, but of course, these things aren't coincidental. Um, with that FAU, uh, well, the NT government was over a barrel. They, it was one of those uh, uh, things where you don't have a choice. They had to sign up. And no Aboriginal organisations at all were ever involved in the development of this critical MOU. Um, so uh, the arrangements for our, in that uh, MOU, the arrangements for our stations and homeland funding since self-government in 1978 were completely overturned. So this is a radical move uh, and not a single Aboriginal organisation was involved and really the NT government, if you look at the letters between Claire Martin and John Howard, uh, the NT government were really, uh, didn't have nowhere to turn. Uh, they either signed up to this MOU or they got nothing for housing. So the Commonwealth said in that MOU that there would be no more Commonwealth funding for new or rebuilt or refurbished housing uh, and in infrastructure on those communities. So they just threw the out stations and homelands communities to the NT government, knowing that it did not have the resources to take this up. So the MOU specifically, ruled, specifically it's there in you know, black and white, ruled out support for 500 communities across the territory. That was a lot of communities and a lot of people. So this, I think, is a fact of fundamental importance. And I think outside the territory, at least, hardly anybody knows about this. And I think even inside the territory, most people often find it difficult to figure out just what's gone on. They know it's happened on the ground, but how's, you know, what's the policy? Where's all the bits of paper about this? The, the, the Commonwealth government tried to keep this MOU secret, but it fell off the back of a truck. And so it's now publicly, publicly available. So the question is, uh, what has happened to our stations and homelands as a result of these policies? So if you look at the population statistics, uh, we find that today there are approximately 6,500 people living in 380 homelands communities. In 2006, there are about 10,000, maybe more, living in about 560 communities. So from that, to 6,500. That is a big decline. That's a big population loss at the time that the Aboriginal population of the Northern Territory has been growing. Uh, so the decline in the number of people living in small communities, that's under 200 residents, so that includes some other communities that aren't outstations, but the figures recently worked out for that. That's been in a quite steep and unrelenting decline since 2007. Uh, people, have gone, people have gone to the larger communities or to town. So why? Well, they've gone basically because the housing stock is now very old, overcrowded, dilapidated. The NT government provides money for repairs and maintenance and improvements, um, but that's a fraction of what's needed. So there's no room for growth, no aspirations for the future, and as well, other services, schools, health have been wound back as well. So without the chance to have new houses or to rebuild houses, the future must look pretty bleak for many people living in homelands and outstations, I think. Now, of course, Aboriginal people have shown independence and initiative, and they live in sheds, in caravans, etc., in order to stay on their lands, but it should not be like this. So that just brings me getting towards the end to what about the future? And I think the key thing to know uh, on this strand is that the NT government has had a major review of Homeland's policy running for over a year. Um, the, the consultant's report from this uh, review is now finished and is within the Northern, with the Northern Territory government. That report could be very important, depending what is in it and how the NT government responds to it. But there may be some hope here, and I think it would be important for people to try and keep a close eye out for this report and the reaction of the government and it becomes public. Um, one problem is the report will probably come out, or, or the report and the NT elections might overlap, so that might cause problems as well. But uh, I made a submission to the to the uh, review, but I only found out about the review really by accident. I'm not sure how many people are aware this review has been going on. I hope so, um, but I think it might be important. So, in summary, um, the essential goals of Aboriginal policy settings in the Northern Territory has been sidelining traditional ownership in the townships, reasserting control over the lives of Aboriginal people, and slowly emptying the countryside of the many small to medium-sized communities 
referred as outstations and homelands. So I think the major objective now uh, for all people concerned has to be to bring the Commonwealth Government back into the story for funding support for homelands and uh, housing. It's not good enough for the Commonwealth to wash its hands of this responsibility and to marginalise homelands and outstations. Um, so there may be hope, as I was saying, and I think perhaps the days of the hard line of hard line ministers might be over. You know, the bruffs, the vanstones, and maybe the even slightly softer hard liners from Labor. Uh, the Times might start, might be suiting homelands again, and maybe they'll be able to take their rightful place alongside other Aboriginal communities in the Territory. So when you put these three separate but intertwined strands together, you know, the leases, the intervention, the attack on homelands, the negative impact of the last 15 years comes into clear focus. I mean, people have lived it, and you can see why once you start to pull these strands together. So this is the lived experience of Aboriginal people. This is a tsunami that has to be turned back for people to regain self-determination and dignity. These have been, I think, the wasted years. Okay, thanks, Teresa. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and, you know, I think it's important after listening to your very thoughtful analysis to once again um, acknowledge how it's been the First Nations people throughout the Northern Territory that have continued to um, be a voice that can't be ignored on this issue. And um, Stephen Gray, I hope not to put you on the spot too much, uh, but I thought it might be good to come back to you now just um, given um, Greg's overview of, of that specific aspect and history of the intervention, um, if there's anything you wanted to add that came from your report and perhaps for people who are interested in accessing the report, how they can do that. Um, there's a link to the report on the Caston Centre. So that's the Centre for Human Rights Law at Monash University. Um, we didn't talk a great deal about the homelands um, in that that report. We were focusing on, but I, I mean that I, as, as Greg has said, that's a really crucially important um, part of this whole issue, and maybe we should look at it more in the future. Um, we we spoke, um, as I mentioned earlier, about the customary law issue and um, the income management and cashless welfare card issue, um, but also. Uh, more generally about the effects that the interventions had on these um, measures, you know, what they call the closing the gap issues of health and life expectancy. And you would think that Indigenous life expectancy, Indigenous health would have improved with all the improvements in these areas for the general population over the last 15 years. And it's happened a little bit, but it hasn't happened anywhere near as much. And I'm sure that um, people who are here would know that really well. So I think all of these issues come together and um, I think it's good that a, a forum like this is able to bring together things like um, the homelands and the issues that, that Greg has spoken about and the other speakers, um, Harry, um, Uncle Harry, and um, I think it's hopefully we can get a, a kind of a, a group of these issues together so that it's a, like a um, something that we can we can lobby and speak about um, with a single voice rather than with lots of different voices. Maybe that, maybe there are, are hopes for change in that way. Yeah, I think you're right in terms of seeing the interconnectedness of all the issues. And I think that's very much how your work does fit in there and, and now people can access it. So we should take this opportunity to thank you for your um, contribution to the discussion tonight. Thank you very much. Um, now, it's my great pleasure um, to introduce, introduce uh, Inya Goyala, um, who is um, a member of the Legislative Assembly, um, very groundbreaking in terms of advocacy, particularly around a treaty, um, a very strong voice uh, from the territory that's being heard right around the country. Um, he is a Leah Dallinmere um, senior leader from the Jumba Poinu. Sorry, so sorry about my Uwalari Gamilaroi pronunciation, my brother, uh, but deepest respect for the work that you're doing. Um, 
he was elected to the Northern Territory Parliament in 2016 as an independent member. So that in itself is, is really strong support from people and has been a really, really strong voice against the Northern Territory intervention and the Stronger Futures for many years and has worked really hard to create inclusive laws and policies um, during that time. But also his work is very forward looking as well with um, uh, very, uh, very focused on advocacy around uh, a treaty and partnership with government and um, respect for the authority of Aboriginal nations across the country, particularly the Northern Territory. So um, it is, it is um, my great pleasure now to hand over to Yingya. Uh, or have we... Let me just check, because I know we had some issues before. And, no. Oh, okay. Well, I'm just going to assume, hopefully, that we're just going to wait and try and get Yingya back. And in the meantime, it's my great pleasure to now move over to uh, introduce um, Amelia Kunath Monks, who I have to say was one of the really strong voices at the time of the interview. Can I hear you now? Can you? Oh, sorry. Hello. Okay, sorry. I will come back to you, Amelia. <laughs> um, <laughs> technology. <laughs> All right. Thank you, my brother. Yo, thank you very much. Uh, I was trying to get, in, get myself unmuted. Uh, okay. Then. And uh, good evening, everyone. And I'm calling from the town of Nolanboy in Arnhem Land. Nolanboy, I believe, is a uh, home of the Red Echingo clan, one of the uh, 13 immediate clans, but there are other clans around the top end of the, along the Arnhem Land coast. So this is. 13 years since the intervention uh, have come into our communities and what has happened in our communities during the intervention. I was on one of the communities when the intervention came through during that time watching and it came right in, in front of me and I was I was there when the first wave of police, army, no force arrived and I saw it all happen. I was there and I even came and went and offered my assistance to try and help, which that then we were all not sure what was, what the good thing was gonna be coming out of this intervention. Uh, people thought it was, it was time to build our communities and make it stronger and, and as a prosper uh, future for our people. That's what everyone was all excited about in, in our communities, watching everything come in, coming onto land. But then uh, we started off uh, helping out and I stood there in between the people in the community and, and the, um, the government or the, or the intervention and did a interpreter service when in 2007 they came and uh, the children that we had then was well behaved and had a good discipline and health checks were done in in a kind of a a um, a, a movable the, um, the hospital type um, tent that that we brought in or that they brought in and built next to the, the community health center that was there already. And so we helped them and there was no uh, checks. There were checks done with the teenagers. They were all at this stage, we're talk, looking at 15 years or 16 years older kids and they're was not much or no active STs or, or sexual 
active in the in the communities. It was because the children were living in communities that were really well behaved and people had their own powers out to look after and uh, and look after the the children, especially the key, um, uh, our elders had power and strength and knew what to do and how how to look after our young people. But in um, straight after that, a year later in 2008, I had to move to Darwin, where I was offered a, a job at Charlestown University and worked there in with uh, Yongo studies. Uh, studying languages of young people in Arnhem Land, East Arnhem Land, and as was a lecturer, a senior lecturer working there. And later on in 2008, 2009, I went returned back to the communities and to go back home on funerals or other other occasion or on trips that I went back to do took the uh, students from the CDU to go and meet with people on country. And then I saw negative changes happening. Our elders, uh, senior leaders, parents, and everyone uh, had been undermined and told they were not, not doing their uh, right thing their way. In, Everybody seemed to be in confusion that we started to be impacted by what had hit us uh, through this intervention that came through. And people were really confusion and started, children could start talk back, swear back at parents and seeing unusual things happening to our children. What, and that was the outcome of this intervention that came through. Uh, this was also um, a push for an assimilation through the, through the, uh, by the Northern Territory government, uh, which was placing a info, info the um, uh, super shires that came in and took over our communities, took over our community councils uh, which we weren't aware of, and soon we found out that we were under the hands of uh, shires, super shires, and um, community councils in our local councils were no longer there. We had a big uh, councils uh, through the shire councils in in places like Nolanboy or Jabiru, in other other places looking after affairs for our communities. And that was also a kind of a, a confusion to our people through that. So here I was in Darwin uh, teaching and disciplining uh, through the Yulmo Studies um, classes, teaching non-Indigenous non about how our Indigenous law and and culture and system of governance works in our communities. Um, I had, since then, I had went went um, digital, which uh, through Skype and all other technology that enabled me to teach people around the uh, around Australia, around the country, and I had few students in around the world, Japan. Germany, in the States, there were classes that were learning about indigenous culture and they were doing very well understanding what, what your law and governance all works about in, the, in uh, living on, on country. But it was when, when we started to go back home, our children were behaving like I said, behaving in a mysterious way that that all discipline, respect, and empowerment, our elders were undermined, taking the powers off. There were people that uh, elders were just sitting sitting in corners and w watching. Some of the 
some of the um, effects that came through, people started to enroll, brought in and was signed in for work of Dal or work for the Dal. Uh, CDP was taken out of, CDP used to work on homelands and in communities were projects that used to run. But everybody, the government then through intervention said everybody needs to come in and and sign in to what they call work for the doll. And when they came in, everybody came in, all our countrymen you know, came in and said, this is my my um, a certificate which I gained during while I was working in, in communities through the land uh, community council and the local government and how things were going. We are, um, I have been doing an apprenticeship and people said, I have a certificate which I am a qualified a plumber working here, a tradesman. Uh, some of them were working as um, in, in administration, uh, in, in offices. But through intervention, they said, you won't be needing this. You need to sign up uh, another form within with the Centrelink here and to achieve white card, then call white card or a yellow Alka card to so that you can work on work on, work for the doll. Sign up on Centrelink and come every day to the Centrelink and sign up, and which disabled everybody. If, if I would have been there that time or before I went away to Darwin, I would have. I would have said, I am a um, uh, aircraft maintenance engineer, and I'm sure that I would have been told, no, you, you won't be needing this anymore. You need to sign this work for the doll. That's how this intervention has, has, has um, kind of uh, crippled us, and it's taken authority and, and, and power of our people. So on homelands, this is, the homeland is an a clan estate. It's a home that where people live healthily on country. This is where we were living. CDP projects were on country after the uh, 1975 um, movement, homeland movements were established that people went back onto their country to create work businesses, grow vegetation, grow fisheries, farming, horticulture, whatever. Um, it was going very well. But then the intervention comes through and and everything is shut down in in the homelands and everybody were, were forced to come into major hub communities. And of course, houses were through the um, through the stronger futures said we will be building replacing these houses they are no no good so that they can be cyclone proof but what they did was they removed all the four bedroom five bedroom six bedroom houses and replaced them with two bedroom three bedroom houses and that's including to um to accommodate those people who came in from homelands and it's been overcrowded since the time when it, uh, the um, stronger features came through. So we've been struggling about this for all the time. And now we are living in crisis right now. Uh, since the, um, since the, um, we have lived since then, since the intervention has lost our authority or our made us lose our authorities a place where our elders and people leaders and people on the ground have lost to make um how we could make a decision making for ourselves for the people so that we could decide what is best for our children, what is best for our communities, what is best for our, um, our future, where do we need to go from here? 
Instead, it was placed by a decline in employment and increase in court hearings, uh, incarceration rates, increase in child removals and suicide. It is a cultural genocide that has happened. And, and that is why I am fighting for self-determination for treaty and a space where and or whatever that gives power back to the communities, to the elders, to our clans, to regain control and improve the future of our children so that we clearly see the pathway and create the pathway where our future children, uh, generation is going to go. Where they have been, where we have been, where we are now, and where we want to see our children to journey so that they prosperously maintain the identity and the dignity of children that we want them to be when we are no longer there with them. We want to, we want them removal. In, we want, we want the, the blanket of the intervention. And I say again, I want the blanket of the intervention removed so that we can have that breathing space again, so that we can be who we are, so that we can be human beings uh, to maintain the, the future generation. So this is what we uh, have been doing, and this is what we have been going on with. Um, I'm not sure if you're still with me, but somehow my computer has backed up. One more. Are you, we can still see and hear you. Ah, you can still see yeah. me. I can't see you guys, sorry. But... Well, we're all here. Yeah, yeah I'm back, back again. Sorry about that. <laughs> Something happened. Yeah, no, it's all right now. Yeah. And this is what we have been uh, fighting for. This is why we have been fighting for. In the, since then, uh, when the Stronger Futures came through and at 2011, I decided to come back because, and leave the Darwin uh, classroom of Balanda students. And I said, um, the behavior of our children in the communities are not the same as anymore. So I need to go back and help my elders so that we can try and fix what has caused this and try to work on this. So when I got back home, we have seen, I met with elders who were starting to talk about, let's try and work on this and let's try and petition the government to stop this intervention, to stop the stronger futures. It is just disempowering our people. It has just taken the powers of our leaders. So we, I started working together with them and we started to form an, a Yorongo Nations Assembly. Yorongo Nations Assembly, which we could advocate with the government. And during that time, uh, 2006, 2015, uh, the elections were coming up and I said to myself, maybe I'll try and get a bit higher where I can start advocating with the government. So I decided to run on the 2016 election and um, I won on the platform of treaty. And that's how I got, got here. This is not something that I want or enjoy working, but I had to be brave to stand here, to, to come up here, not knowing where I am heading, but I'm, I'm just standing here to call, stop that uh, blanket of the intervention and, and roll back, roll back the stronger futures and the policies, the uh, colonial system of looking up and trying to um, uh, stand all over us, let us, we want to be who we are and we want to see where our people are going into. We need to the government to step back and we need an apology today. We need an apology for what has happened. This is not, not a, an area, this is not the people we want to be. 
we we can think for ourselves we can determine for ourselves we can create things for ourselves and we can work and understand we would rather want to make that a pathway let's Paranda and Yolngo work together let's Paranda and Yolngo make a pathway where we both walk together alongside not assimilated do not manipulate us to be under your system of law but Yolngo Romorongo and we stay with the um, Yolngo Romorongo which is a your ways first within our system and you have your balanda balanda room wrong but do not let us be under your system of law and this is where we i strongly declare that we need apology we need apology my people and i need apology right around the northern territory right around australia so that we can be living and so that we can change policies that starts with genuine self-determination and the acknowledgement of of our sovereignty and who we are. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm sure that's thunderous applause. Uh, thank you so much. Now, I think one of the really important points that both Aunty Pat and Uncle Harry made was the importance of listening to people on the ground and and having First Nations people leading um, in these issues and no better place to do that than try and shake up uh, Parliament. So uh, while you might be in, um, encouraging of and thankful for listening to uh, Yingia Mark Guyela's uh, voice there, can I also remind you, this isn't a, his plug, it's my plug for him, that he is running for re-election in the Northern Territory in 2020. So if yes, <laughs> so can I encourage you, um, if you feel inspired by his words and what he's doing and his vision, uh, that you can go uh, and look at the video and donate at um, www.yingiya.net. And I'm sure somebody's going to pop that in the chat section for us so that you've got that uh, to, to support the campaign to keep this very important voice there um, for the people of the Northern Territory. Thank you so much. Yep. Okay. Now, I had, a, I had a run at this before. I'm going to do it again. <laughs> it is my great pleasure to uh, now introduce uh, Amelia Pengati Kunath Monks, who at the time when the intervention rolled out was um, a, a, a very young Arendta woman uh, from Utopia. Um, a, a youth leader uh, still, uh, but she was supporting her grandmother, the um, phenomenal uh, elder Rosalie Kunath Monks, who was also a very strong voice. But Amelia emerged at the time as a very strong voice in her own right um, and has been incredibly strong on highlighting what has happened with the intervention, uh, particularly around the compulsory income management and mental health impact of the intervention. She, she flew across the country and spoke in Sydney and Melbourne um, and has continued to be a strong voice in the Northern Territory. So I'm incredibly proud to be able to introduce Amelia to you tonight. Lovely to see you, Amelia. Thank you for having me. Um, first of all, I want to acknowledge the past, present and future generations of our First Nations people on the land I sit on, which is the um, Mbandua, Alice Springs. Um, we're now 13 years in the Northern Territory emergency response, and I haven't seen anything change, not, not to my knowledge. I haven't seen anything change to where our languages are being taught in school to where we are allowed to practice our cultural essence. We, we had our 10 year anniversary of the Northern Territory Emergency Response back in 2017. And here we are in 2020, three years under the Stronger Futures. We've got another two years and then we'll have a review of where the policies for us will take us. It's very hard to see where our youth is at the moment. I feel heartache because our youth get into trouble because there is no, nothing. There's no programs for them or 
um, or leaders who are there. They don't have good role models because they're forever watching stuff on YouTube about how to be a gangster and all like that. It's, it's very disconcerting of where our youth is heading. You just have to look at our suicide rates. You know, it's, it's very hard. I was speaking to my grandmother last night on the drive back home and she said to me, I asked her the question, how do you see our youth? Where, where do you think they're going? And she said to me that there are no role models for them. They're in this um, predicament of where they want to have their culture and be who they want to be and be themselves but they are also told to just stay down there. Don't move. We'll, we'll, we'll do everything for you so you can be run amok and just, you know, not, not have a future. We'll take that future for you. As, um, you know, the, the stuff on my homeland out at Utopia, it's, Opera itself has become the hub town. There is no funding for the 16 homelands to get new houses. There is, what they're trying to do is push us into that hub town still to this day so that they can do mining. There is this whole gap between our First Nations people and our non-First Nations people, but that's not our non-First Nation people's fault. I don't blame them at all. What I blame is their government and their policies. We, we still are. Here we are in 2020 and we're still classified as flora and fauna. We're still counted in the census. We're, we're, not, um, we're not even in the constitution as human beings. We're still animals and flowers. Yeah, that, that's all I have to say. Thank you, Amelia. Um, I just wonder, though, if you could share with us, um, you know, what, what you would, what your hopes are going forward, what sorts of things are on your agenda for change? Do you, do you believe in the treaty? Um, you know, what sorts of things do you think would make a difference on the ground from, from where you are and what you've seen and what you believe in? Yeah, I, I do believe in the treaty. I believe that we need to have this treaty. Um, I've all, I've said constantly to my grandmother, I've said where we are now, is not is not a good place between First Nations people and non-First Nations people. And until Australia grows up, we're not going to get very far with our government because time for talk is over. It, it really is. There, there is no communication with our government who can come to the table and sit with us. You just have to look at what Vincent Lingiari went through. Look at that walk-off. And where are we today? We're still there. Not much has changed since my elders, my elders' days. Well, thank you very much for sharing that with us. And it's wonderful to hear your voice again and speaking with you speaking out as well. Um, it's, in fact, it's great to see so many people who were there. I can see Marlene here too on my screen. There's an is one of the old warriors. <laughs> it's great to see you too. Um, now, I am so pleased to be able to be in a position to introduce you to this next troublemaker. Uh, one of my, uh, the people I really admire when the intervention happened, Barbara Shaw was right out the gate and she stayed out the gate um, as one of the great uh, spokespeople and warriors around this issue. Uh, Barbara's Aranta Tatichi, Walpri and Waramangu from Alice Springs. Uh, she's the first female deputy chair for the Central Land Council for the new CEO. She's involved in the working group for the Uluru Statement. 
She was an engagement officer for the Royal Commission into the Protection and Detention of Children in the Northern Territory. Uh, she's a cultural carer within her own family and, of course, a founding member and current member of the Intervention Rollback Action Group, or IRAG. So, um, Barb, it's great to see you and um, to hear what you have to say. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. And... Um, I'd like to also acknowledge the traditional owners um, and all custodians of this land, both past, present and future, and as well as acknowledging young emerging leaders such as my niece, Amelia Cunop. Um, There's something I want to do before I get started. Hello to my little friend, friends, Jalamba and Iskra. Ah. Because <laughs> they're also watching me, I hope. Um, yes, I see Paddy Gibson down there somewhere. Yep, yeah, he's there, him and that. Um, I don't know. I don't know what I can say. Um, I've, like you said, been there for the last 13 years. Watch John Howard and Mel Brupp announce it on ABC. <clears throat> and I've been fighting ever since because I knew that I was doing the right thing by my family, my children, my elders, <clears throat> and standing up for what was right. Um, I'd have to say for Auntie Pat, you know, that she's right in saying support for family and children to be out on country. Uncle Harry's been a vocal elder leader in Yundamu since day one also. And our honorable member for Nullumboy, he says it all and he's spot on. Even though he's from Yungo Nation in the top end and I come from the center, there's nothing's changed between us. As a, I guess now, and for also what Amelia was saying is that there might have been minor changes to our lives, but worst of all, it, it's changed for the worst. You know, we just had, you know, Greg Marks talk and Stephen Gray talk about statistics and what had happened and then all of these reports coming in going into both territory government federal government but then these reports and commissions reviews they've all just probably swept past the eyes of all these parliamentarians over the years, over the last 13 years. Like Uncle Harry said, you know, we've had five prime ministers, four to five prime ministers, no one's taken any notice. Over the years, over the last 13 years, you know, from 2007, I was a very angry and emotional person around the policies and how it was affecting our mob. Not only us in the northern, in our major town centres, Alice Springs, Tennant Creek, Catherine, Darwin, and, you know, up at Nullumboy because they're the major town centres that services our communities or our homelands. But they also, our mob, travel in and out of these town centres and or service centres. So, I, I, you know, when it first came out, I, all I thought was of my grandfather, you know, was my initial thought is how is he gonna understand the legislation? And then 
knowing that he's caretaker and living out on my homeland that I got handed back in 1988, straight after the Barunga Statement was handed to Bob Hawke. People like, you know, only Rosie Cunock monks that Amelia now represents and stands up for her grandmother. Uncle Harry's been standing up since the Central Land Council started, you know, and of course you got Mark for the Yulunga mob. And then you have my mob, you know, I've, I've been to, began to realize that if we're gonna keep protesting, you know, you, you're gonna have that other element in our society saying, you know, we don't need protesters or, you know, you've got an opponent that's going to feed false lies to the rest of Australia saying, you know, there's no police brutality, there's no um, child abuse happening in our communities. Well, for a fact, we know that it's happening. We know that, you know, being part of the Royal Commission, you know, the, and looking at children being abused in the detention centres or in and out of home care and you know, so along with Granny, I've got to say hello to you too, Granny. I haven't seen you for a while. You know, we we've been very diplomatic. You know, so I, I'm 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 in a position now. You know, with the Central Land Council, and also still with Tungajura Land Tungajura Council, and just speaking up on issues that affect our mob and how governments and agencies can help our mob and, and and I am a big strong believer in constitutional change and supporting treaty because if we were added into the constitution and we had our rights to our culture, our language, our land, the intervention wouldn't have been in place and it would have been, it would have had to be in a block. But I, 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 I believe there are people out there that are willing and caring, comp compassionate people that are able to help and stand up for people like myself or people like our elders out in remote communities or on homelands. You know, I don't have to go into details, but I know even to this day, you know, we're still talking about how there's no jobs for people out there. It was all taken over by the Shire when CDP was scrapped. You know, our housing, our housing situation is worse than ever. And I sit on the, as a, you know, as a co-chair for Aboriginal Housing NT. And um, we talk about housing issues all the time and trying to get um, better housing conditions fixed for our people. And, you know, in, reality there is no such thing as an aboriginal person living as a nuclear family it, it will never happen it's just like when the coronavirus kicked in you wasn't going to separate us by isolating us because that wasn't in our culture because we're family orientated and we're people of gatherings um so we were actually safer at home in our with our families than being isolated, you know, because we don't know isolation unless we've gone to jail or we sit down in hospital for a long time. So um, education, you know, it, the statistics on education is right because I, I work as a youth worker at night and I know for a fact that a lot of our kids on the streets here in Alice Springs don't go to school, you know, and and, and, and it's pretty sad that, you know, they can adopt another culture, but yet our youth aren't educated enough and um, to be caretakers and take over their grandfather and their grandmother's roles in their communities or out on country. And, and, and it's sad to say, you know, and, and Amelia had already said it, there are no programs or there's no support mechanisms in place for our elders and our leaders to start teaching our younger generation to become those elders and leaders in the future. 
Um, so, you know, wherever I can, I, I, I stand up for what is needed. And our, our people actually need to be recognised and our people need to be listened to. Because if no one, you know, if no one listens today, who's going to listen in the future? So it's, it's the best thing to start teaching our kids because, or our next generation, about what had happened in the past because what's going to happen in the past is going to just keep continuing until somebody gets it right and until we get the right people in Parliament. And people like our member from Nulamboy, he he's doing the right thing, you know, and people are starting to talk, but we need to might might have to start listening to our member from the top end. And, you know, if you get people like Uncle Harry who says, I've been there before, I've been fighting the fight for so long, generations after generation, and yet here I am still today, living in the same community where nothing's changed. And, you know, I've got to say, you know, out of utopia, you still have people living in tin sheds and whatever materials that they can find. And I know, I know that because I've got family out that way as well. And when you look at, you know, okay, with the current situation with the coronavirus, it was really hard on food security for our mob in our community stores because we already know with the intervention, the food prices went up. So people are still buying a lot less for um, a high price of food, you know? So the high cost of living out in remote communities has not helped our mob close the gap on health. You know, a lot of, a lot of our mob are still suffering with diabetes, heart problem, kidney failure, you know, the lack of identity when it, you know, comes to um, being somebody who belongs on, on country, you know, we get so much racism in this town, you know, we're, we're the biggest high populated police town in little alone Australia, but, you know, in, in the territory. And, you know, we, after what happened last year, wouldn't, you know, Kuman Jay Walker, it was really hard to try and have those conversations with the police because it, it, it's going to take a long time for our mob to start trusting police again. You know, they came in with the army in 2007 and they came in, yeah. And yet they can't focus on trying to keep their kids at school, you know? So when it, when it comes to a lot of issues that affect us, Black Lives do matter because we need a roof over our heads. We need to keep our kids out of jail. We need to keep our men and women safe from family and domestic violence. You know, we need to make sure there are proper food security for our people in remote communities. And we need to close the gap on our health and our life expectancy. And the government is not going to do that alone unless they start listening to us and working general, generally with us, you know. So, and I've had these decent conversations with um, um, Federal Minister Ken Wyatt. So... You know, I, I believe that he might he is a good understanding person and you know he's you know, gotta take my hat off to him because he's the first minister Aboriginal person who's ever had this role and we should be having these genuine conversations with him. And he needs to start listening because in South in WA they were having all of those community closures. And you know, suicide is also affecting Aboriginal people in WA, you know, sacred site damages, all of that kind of stuff. So yeah, I don't know what else to say. <laughs> just maybe one thing just to, to get your final thoughts on there, Barb, is um, I'm interested, you worked on the Royal Commission that came out of uh, the horrendous images from Dondale. 
and you you work with the land councils you've you've done the UN um, complaint um, you're working in the housing you <laughs> it's, you know you're doing everything um, but I was interested that one of the you know um, I was wondering how you in all the things you do where do you think we see the most change and can make the most difference um, and I was particularly interested in in your thoughts around how important representation in Parliament is Well, I I ran um, I I ran as a candidate for the Greens Party, um, both in the federal election and territory election. But um, I I guess it, it is because it you know I wouldn't be able to win a seat in Alice Springs given you know this element in this town. But yeah, it, I I reckon. The best thing you need is an Aboriginal person for, especially for our um, our bush seats, and that's most marginalised. You know, we've got oh, um, oh, but they're starting to shift the boundaries now, so there's less seats in Parliament. But you you have to have the right people in there, you know, like uh, which days Claire Martin. Paul Henderson days, you know, we had a lot of um, Aboriginal MLAs in the past, but, you know, I, I believe that they should have done a lot more to stand up for us against the federal um, John Howard era, um, and as well as Tony Abbott. But when you, you know, when he ran the country, but when we have our own people representing our own people in Parliament, because it's, it's the legislators that's going to make a change. And if our legislators and our members of parliament are gonna make a difference to our people, I'll, I'll, you know, that's where it's gotta be. And then you got those, you know, non-Aboriginal people that have been around Aboriginal people for a long time or First Nations peoples that know the issues, you know, and, and they know what's needed. They're the, they're the ones that are also to be supported. So it's the people who's going to make a change are the legislators and we need to get on those legislators' ears. This is a really difficult format to chair and, and do questions from, but what I do want to do is just go back to our speakers just to see, now you've heard everyone talk and all the other issues, just to see, no pressure if there's not, but just to see if they want to say anything else based on what, what's happened. And I, um, I might just check in with you, Arnie, Pat, to see if there's anything extra you wanted to say. Having heard... Uh, I think what um, the other speakers are talking about, we're all coming together and we have the same attitude of what's happening and it's uh, really good. But I think if anybody else wanted to... They should talk. Mm. We all can hear what's going on. Hey, Bob. Uh, yep. Yeah. No worries. Uncle, Harry. Be... Uncle Harry, can I just check in and see if you wanted to say anything? Can we just make sure Uncle Harry's not on, not muted? I'm not gonna lie that. That's very much now. Can you hear me? Can hear you now, Uncle Harry. Yeah. Right. The only question that I'd like to ask. What are we going to do? What is the government going to do? I don't know exactly what they are doing, but what are they going to do? Ratify their mistake, a lot of horrible mistakes the government has made in bringing this intervention and hasn't brought in that to uh, uh, create to, uh, a better feeling between the, the, the Aboriginal people of Australia, or certainly of Northern Territory, and, uh, and other areas, uh, and, uh, or other interested family members staying in other states. Uh, what is the government going to do? Is they going to still let that thing, uh, the intervention, still go? That's a question I'm asking. It's mm. a good question. Um, Ying Yao, do you, did you, wanna, um, do you have any extra comments based on what we've been 
uh, talking about, just to give you a chance to jump in there. Did you do that? <coughs> uh, you're not I'm on. Yep, you're, you can hear you now, I think. You're all good. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Um, it's just where we are here now, and where do we go from here? And we'd like to. Uh, I've in the parliament, I've gone as far as I could up in the parliament to fight this intervention, to stop it. Where are the ears in these politicians? Yes. In the, Where are the in ears? The Northern Territory government uh, is played by two major parties, the ALP and the CLP. And they're not working for us. And they're not supporting us. And I have to be really frank in, in, in this. And I now, I walked into the parliament and I wanted to tell the people, we are, it's sickening. We are being damaged. Our lives are being damaged. Our, our children are being scattered, taken away and uh, incarcerated. Elders, people in the communities, stop it. Help us stop it. And, and at this stage, I've run into, um, it seemed like I ran into a, a dead end on the road. Where do, I, where do I go from here? Have we got outside people or lawyers or those people who knows how we can tackle this problem? How do we uh, actually go and sit down with, with government, with the federal government, to roll back the intervention, to get those freedom back, to have that yep. space that where do we go from here? Who is going to be standing with us? I'm sure, I believe there is a way that we can work toward. Uh, treaty is one of the reasons. I know living in Arnhem Land, people down south maybe or wherever say treaty is not going to happen, this, that and the other. But I want to tell our brothers and sisters that treaty have happened to us in, the, in, in Arnhem Land. East Arnhem Land, when we had uh, trades with Macassans, there was mm. treaty, treaty happening then. So it's possible it can happen, but we need to work together to get that problem. <coughs> we can't be just knocking our head on the... I come into the parliament and now I've run into a, uh, a brick wall and trying to hit, hit my brain on the wall, trying to someone let, let me go in. But we've got to try in some other way of trying to get closer to the government and create. And that something is something that we need to work on. And I don't have the answer, but we, I'm gonna try. But I, I believe there is an answer. There is a gap there where we can work towards. Um, That's all. Thank you. Uh, Stephen, did you wanna add anything um, after hearing everyone else's comments? Just giving you a chance. I was thinking when um, Adi Bab was talking before about the police and the um, incident with Kumanjai Walker and how difficult it's going to be and how long it's going to take to get the trust of the community back in the police. And I don't think that most um, non-Indigenous people would really understand what that means and how this all relates to the history. And I guess the thing I would want to say is, and we've seen this Black Lives Matter, and we've seen, you know, the statues and this whole discussion about history and the Prime Minister didn't really comment about history just last week. It shows how little, you know, they actually understand about the real history of the country. And yeah. I guess when it comes to treaty and comes to these bigger issues, I think um, it's really important that non-Indigenous people, especially, I mean, Aboriginal people already know the history, but non-Indigenous people, I don't think have been taught that and I don't think have really learned it as a whole. And I think it's... Um, really important that the, the country as a whole and especially non-Indigenous people who don't know these things learn about Aboriginal history. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Greg, did you have anything to uh, No, I don't think so. Thanks, Larissa. Listening carefully, I mean, it's all, um, I find it very interesting, but it's all distressing, of course. And one of the frustrating things is we knew 13 years ago, 15 years ago, where this was all going to end up. And, um, it's a combination of 
deliberateness in policy makers and stupidity at the same time. It's very frustrating, but I think that Mark and others are right. You just have to keep bashing away and finding a way through. Yeah, thanks. Amelia, did you want to make any other comments? Um, I think one comment I'd like to make is that I think the future can be very bright if we have the right leadership and the way that we as a country need to grow. Lovely. Um, and Barb, did you want to add anything? Um, I think the best thing that we can probably do as a nation is share our stories and have these real discussions with people and, you know, stop listening to people who's misleading the country because at the end of the day, we are Aboriginal people, First Nations people that was affected by a very racist policy that only affected Aboriginal people living on homelands, communities, and town camps throughout the Northern Territory. And we are still affected by this policy, no matter it falls under, you know, there was a five year caretaker mode for the emergency response, but we live it under, <clears throat> we still living under it through stronger futures. And tell everybody, you know, I, I would, and I've been on income management, even though I work and I'm a deputy chair for a big statutory organization, I'm still on income management because I still have to do my obligations. And my compassion is where it lies, you know, for our, our, our rights to be reconciled with. And we, we, we will never have that recognition, not yet. And Amelia is right to say, we have to wait. You know, it might be a long time waiting, but we're going to get there someday. But at the end of the day, you know, if we don't keep the fire burning and keep the fight going, you know, who's going to be there to stand up for my grandchildren or my great-grandchildren. Are my great-grandchildren gonna be in the same predicament as we are today? So I would, I'd prefer to, you know, tell 10 friends, make sure you have that open discussion. And, you know, because we live it and we tell it how it is. Because that policy has not, you know, just only affected us as Aboriginal people, but it affected our work colleagues our very close friends, you know, who are non-Aboriginal, people might have gained a profit out of the intervention, but at the end of the day, we all suffered. And people don't care about the emotional stress that we have to live under day to day, day in, day out, you know, every night, and then watch our kids suffer more because of the systemic racism that we have in this country. So if you don't want to be treated, you know, you need, people need to be educated on how it is in the Territory because not only in, in, in the Territory, but, you know, what whatever's happening here, it's going to start that ripple effect elsewhere. You know, suicide is right across the country. You know, youth imprisonment is right across the country. You know, the income management here and the basic card in the Territory. But look how much money is going to be spent on you know, the cashless debit card. It's costing the government $8,000 for me, you know, to stay on income management and to have my Centrelink or welfare payments income managed. It might get me by and I still work, you know, I contribute to the society. We all do, we, con we contribute to the society. We contribute to the economics of this country this country wouldn't be where it is today without the, you know, back of the hands of the Aboriginal person, men and women in this country, you know? So whether if it be racist or not, but you guys need to, you know, non-Aboriginal people need to have these real conversations about our livelihoods in this country. Yeah. I don't know. 
Thank you, Barb. It's, it's a good reminder too of the responsibility that non-Indigenous people have to support um, these changes. Um, I, I'd just like to acknowledge that the forum today was uh, put together and uh, uh, brought to you by the Concerned Australians, um, the Intervention Rollback Action Group or IRAG and the Stop the Intervention Collective Sticks, who have all been um, stalwarts in these campaigns and uh, the sorts of groups you can keep in contact with to uh, find out what you can do. I think the message that comes through is that there needs to be an end of the intervention policies and, a, and an embrace of the principle of self-determination. I think what has also resonated tonight is how important it is to make sure the voices of First Nations people are central uh, in those changes and going forward. I'm very pleased that we're recording tonight, for those of you who noticed the ABC Radio National Tile there, um, so that we'll be able to broadcast these really important voices across the country, not just for those of you who have shown the respect to take the time to listen to them tonight. Um, it's, um, it's also uh, probably a, a good time to just um, remind you um, of the um, way you can support um, Yingya Mark Goyala's campaign uh, on that www.yingiya.net website. And can I also say, um, there's a great film on the ABC uh, on Sunday the 5th of July at 9.30 called In My Blood It Runs. Um, Amelia's given us a wonderful uh, younger voice to hear and, and we've had all our elders, our aunts and uncles here. Um, but this film is about an 11-year-old boy, uh, Dewan Hooson, who lives in Alice Springs and through that film, you can see how all of these policies that uh, people have spoken about tonight play out in that young boy's life. Um, so I really encourage you, if you've got a chance to see it or to see it on iView, um, to hear that very powerful voice. It's called In My Blood It Runs. Um, it's been a, a real privilege for me to host this, although I'm used to not used to their technology and it's, it's been its own challenge. And, Everyone knows I'm not really good with it, with all this technical stuff, but I've got to say it's been wonderful to um, to be able to facilitate a discussion with uh, people who've been at the forefront of uh, fighting for the rights of Aboriginal people in the country and these very important important voices and and wonderful as I said before to see a lot of the old campaigners, uh, particularly. Um, Aunty Marlene there, who've uh, who've been there for the long journey. So, um, can I I get you all to um, uh, join me once more in uh, giving a silent but enthusiastic clap to our speakers? So, uh, Stephen Gray, Aunty Pat Ansel Dodds, Uncle Harry Jackamara Nelson, uh, Greg Marks, uh, Yinya Mark Goyala. Um, the member for Nullumboy and hopefully will remain the member of Nullumboy, mm -hmm. um, Amelia, uh, Kunis Monks, and of course, Barb Shaw. Have a good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Good night. Bye. Bye.